Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session on AI for customer service. Uh, we'll start off with a round of intros. I'm Mike Schubert. I'm Vice President of Technology for Unum Group. Uh, we're a leading group disability insurer uh, in the United States. Uh, and I'm accountable for uh, all of our claims, payments, contact center, uh, and consumer portal technology. So a lot of customer facing stuff. Uh, it's very exciting in this space. Uh, in addition to the, the back office. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to Mike. Yep, thank you. I'm Michael Krepidowski. I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Core AI. Um, we provide companies just like yourselves with a conversational AI platform uh, to uh, automate interactions, either for customer service, uh, for employee experience, um, use cases like HR and IT, those types of things. So they can interact and get information, whether it's customers or employees, uh, through simple conversation. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we also do that with the contact center as well, helping agents uh, through interactions. So great to be here. Thanks. Just uh, on. Rick Ballman, uh, Vice President of Engineering, American Express, uh, focused on data intelligence, customer and colleague experience, um, certainly the contact center theme uh, as we continue to roll through, uh, looking at AI ML to drive omni-channel experiences, make the call centers more intelligent and just really drive the customer service uh, experience for our customers. So happy to be here. And I'm Amanda Romko. Uh, I am representing Team Safe Light today. Uh, we have some other people in the audience from the team. Uh, I uh, lead CX and CRM at Safe Light. So we are in a negative service category. Uh, you, when you have to come visit us, you're probably not in a great mood because you uh, had damage to your car. So my job is to make sure that you have the most frictionless experience as possible. Nice. All right, so we got a pretty wide range panel here, a lot of customer service background. And you know, one of the questions that often comes up uh, in this space is, you know, just what's the state of adoption uh, across either customer service or our industry? And, and I'll tee it off, to, and I'm not gonna speak for all of insurance, that, that's a pretty wide ranging uh, and, and deep conversation. But on the customer service front, even within Unum, uh, we're at every stage of the game that, that you can imagine. Uh, we've dipped our toe in the water with uh, chatbots. Uh, we attempted to build some. Uh, we built some very well, I would say, that could handle simple questions, uh, simple use cases uh, within the, the claimant journey. Where it gets more difficult is when you start interacting uh, and you start diverging uh, from what the chatbot is is expecting. And it's only been in the recent years that we found a few vendors in the space that did this really well, did it better than my engineers could do, uh, just piecing together cloud technology, because you end up with people context switching or changing their intent as they're talking to you. You may be asking them uh, a series of questions that build on each other, uh, in my space for a, a hospital claim, we may ask, you know, who's your doctor? Uh, the question before was, what was the date of service? And I may be expecting, who's your doctor? And you start telling me, oh, wait, I was wrong. Uh, it was actually November 5th. Well, as a human, you can figure that out and say, oh, they're answering the previous question. Mm -hmm. But where my engineers failed was realizing they're on the previous question. And that, that's really where we had to go into the vendor space to help identify, you know, help solve that challenge rather than sling code uh, constantly at it. One final thing, and then I'll, I'll uh, uh, hand it over, is to say um, that, uh, and I already forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that happened. That does. Well, I'll, I'll um, dovetail off what you're saying. I think, um, you know, you bring up a really good point um, is you're looking at conversational AI platforms, right, trying to help automate certain processes. Uh, it is important uh, that the vendor that you're looking at uh, can understand multiple intents, um, you know, can actually look at sentence structure, right, instead of just keywords, those types of things. So it's actually understanding the intent of what the person is to, uh, trying to accomplish. And, and it's also very important, right? As you say, um, you know, I want to pay this bill. I want to do something, look at a claim. But then all of a sudden you say, but before that, I'd like to do this. So really good conversational AI platforms. 
allow it to collect those multiple intents, you know, finish one and say, okay, now let's get back to the other you know, you know, thing you were trying to accomplish. So really important to think about those things. Yeah, and I'll just add, I, I, when I think about the state of adoption, um, I mean, the fact that we're all in Las Vegas attending an AI conference <laughs> would tend to mean that the adoption's pretty healthy. Um, I think within American Express in particular, uh, we do recognize there's a, there's a large number of opportunities for AI, uh, but we also are trying to balance ethical and responsible ways to use AI. Um, I think with, you know, with financial companies and a lot of different various pieces of industry, like the choices we make can affect the lives of, of our customers dramatically. If you think about applying for a loan for some desperate need or financial relief or, or, or what have you, as we push AI further and further into helping us make those decisions more quickly and more effectively, if we're not careful about how we, how we ethically do that, um, I think uh, it's not the direction that we wanna go. So for American Express, we're moving forward um, you know, quickly in some places and carefully in other places, but, but the, uh, the state of, of, of adoption is very, very promising and it's an exciting space for sure. So can I just add to your um, looking at balance? Uh, for us, because you're in a, negative service category and our customers are usually pretty stressed out because their vehicle is damaged. We're looking for the balance between technology and human. So when we're when we're doing our AI discovery right now in design, we're looking at ways that we can supplement the human experience because the one thing AI can't do is create that empathy. So you're filing a claim, somebody might have broken into your car and you're very upset about it using AI during that entire experience um, might not always be the way to go. So how do you kind of interject and play? So we've been working with, uh, you know, our contact center and our digital team are ways that we can interject the human experience into digital, um, not just always thinking that we can automate everything. Yeah. It's great, great call out. I feel like you two are sandwiched between uh, negative experiences from the, uh, the claims <laughs> yes. standpoint. <laughs> um, yes. But, it, you know, it, it's a great call out. So where does AI have the biggest impact in uh, customer services, Michael? Um, well, uh, you mentioned some of them, right? So immediately, a lot of companies start with, uh, you know, the lowest hanging fruit, things like FAQs, answers to questions, things that are on your public website or in your, in your mobile app um, that customers can go through. I mean, if you think about an FAQ or driving customers to an FAQ page, often you have to search in multiple areas before you can find an answer or if you find an answer at all. Um, so with conversational AI through a virtual assistant, you know, that conversation can ebb and flow and, and you can ask the question, it goes out and finds the information from an FAQ and then uh, gives it back to the customer. That's of course a very simple use case, but then um, I liked what you were talking about, right? What you're trying to balance at SafeLight mm -hmm. is the idea of, you know, how do you balance human and, um, you know, digital or, um, you know, your, your uh, virtual assistant employees, right? Um, so you start to think about use cases like somebody um, goes on the website, they use the bot to uh, fill out uh, a form for a mortgage application, then they get connected to a human who says, okay, yes, you're actually approved, right? And then they might hand them back um, to a virtual assistant and say, hey, now we've got to gather a whole bunch of things uh, for underwriting. And so your virtual assistant will help you with all that gathering and uploading of documents and so on. So, you know, if you can think of a use case, right, that, you know, you think you want to automate some of it or part of it, um, you know, you can, you can probably do it with conversational AI. You just have to figure out what's the customer appetite or propensity to use a virtual assistant versus a human. And it's not just front office. Yeah. So there's a great McKinsey article that I was just reading that talks about how 65% of everything in customer service from a back office perspective can be automated today, mm -hmm. today. So how are you using your people yes. to be the frontline person to help the customer through while automating most of your back office operations? Um, and so those are the types of things that we're really looking at right now in our transformation is what are the types of things that we can do in the background mm -hmm. um, that won't interject with that customer experience uh, and then allows our really highly trained um, associates to be able to deal with more complex situations. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, automation is a very, very strong use case for AI for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the challenges I'm trying to solve is 
is how do I make every single one of our 100 million customers feel as though they are the only customer we have? When they call, <laughs> we remember what they said before. When they, you know, when they, there's so many channels, there's, there's mobile, there's web, there's phone, there's voice. There's so many ways for our customers to interact with us and so many customers in total. But how can I make every one of those touch points feel personal in a way that's like makes that customer feel like they are unique? I'm trying to figure out how to get AI to the point where it can really sort of bring all that what we call context together of what's happening in the environment. Not only, here's a good example, you know, not only is it the, is it the history of what that customer has done, but what are other customers in the, the same area of the world, you know, calling us about? Are they calling us about a data breach? Chances are the next customer that calls is probably calling about a data breach as well. We should be considering all of that environmental information that's a really cool problem for AI to try to solve, to make our customer service uh, folks feel you know, that much more personal, just add that in. Yeah. yeah. Can I have a follow up to the, the people in IT from a business perspective? <laughs> How are you informing your business partners also back? You, you're talking mm. about a lot of channels. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the thing that um, a lot of people are talking about and have been talking about for a while is Omni and what are the right channels. How are you also pushing back uh, on the business just to rethink or the best use cases so that you don't always have to be everywhere for every channel? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I, one of the things that I really push is what's the escalation path? So we can do so many things at, you know, tier one where it's a chat bot, we're getting to the FAQ or whatever. But now I'm asking a question about my policy or something like that. And maybe I've got some sort of conversational AI that can go back, reach into those systems and start fielding those questions. But now I have a question specific to filing a claim or something that is just outside the bounds of, of what this agent can handle. And what I've coached my stakeholders on is we've got to keep it seamless. They've already asked half a dozen questions. They've already given all these answers to Erica or Jesse or whatever we're calling our, our agent these days. How is it when Mike picks up the phone and is talking to this person, all of that seamlessly flows through such that they don't have to repeat themselves and we're, we're now at the next step of the game and we've spanned those channels. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's really good. I think, you know, the other thing that you mentioned, making them feel special or personalize their experience, but it's also very important to have that connected experience, you know, especially as you were saying across all those channels and interfaces and so on. So, um, you know, as you have all of those channels, you don't have to provide access to every channel, but the ones you do, they have to feel like it's the same company, the same experience as much as possible. It's going to be slightly different, of course, but um, and then, you know, have it be connected. So if you are leveraging AI, right, it, it is able to extract that information based on the context and, and, and intent of what's going on in the interaction. And then, of course, um, you know, if and when they do need to talk to a human, right, I would never suggest cutting off humans. You know, this isn't a replacement like IVRs in the 1980s were supposed to be a replacement for agents, never worked out, right? So, um, you know, there are certain use cases or things because of empathy or other things that you need to talk to a human. So how do you help the human uh, agent through the interaction, right? So that bot could continue um, with the agent and, you know, be listening or reading through the conversation and suggesting or somebody says, well, I don't know what your return policy is, or where do I find my policy? And it actually will pop up or provide links or do things proactively. So again, it's a more effective, um, you know, better experience where they can focus more on the customer, as you said, rather than, you know, all the nuts and bolts trying to locate or find information. Yeah. AI won't fix bad tools or bad interactions. So right. I think that's something right. for, as you go back to your businesses or your, your teams and you're trying to figure that out, the way that we're thinking about it is, you know, we have a very robust digital channel and it's very well um, planned out and designed. And so how do we make that experience better and focusing in the experiences that are already going well? So focusing in your IVR, if it's not a great channel right now and not a great interaction is not the place that you should be looking to, to build on top of that. I'd say it'll, it would amp it's going to amplify problems yes. that you have um, if you're not careful. So. Yes. Spot on. Um, so I, I'm sure we've all got a ton of, of revealing stories, but uh, if you could 
share a revealing story about AI and customer service, whether it's a use case, challenge you experienced, or, or even something you, you heard from a colleague, what would it be? Yeah, so I was actually talking to our team when we were traveling about uh, what, I should, what I should bring up today. Um, mine is not necess necessarily customer experience, but it's super relevant right now. So I've been asking Alexa um, for the past like week about the weather because my daughter is actually turning 10 this weekend and she's having a pool party. And I was very stressed out about whether or not it was gonna rain and the likelihood of rain coming up over the next last few days. So I kept just like asking her like, what does the weather outlook look like over the next seven days, five days? I'm like kind of counting down all the days. And um, right before I left and flew out yesterday, um, she asked me actually, when I asked her about the weather again for Saturday, if I wanted to get an update on severe weather, if it was going to happen in my area and be proactively notified about it. And mm -hmm. I was like, huh, that was like a smart way to think about like, hey, I've been asking about this all the time at the same time every single day. Now she's going to like proactively tell me about this if this is an important thing to me. And so I think good AI when it comes to customer service should not feel like AI. It just should feel like a natural thing that happens to you. So it was a little hard for me to think of like a bad experience because I was, I don't, I don't know, it, it should act like it doesn't exist. Um, so I don't know if it's actually even AI dri driven or just a bot that somebody created yeah. that was terrible. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was kind of my experience and something that I thought of. Um, we once, uh, we once shipped out like 300 replacement cards to a single customer once. Um, <laughs> so if anybody's ever gotten a replacement card for American Express, they usually come in a FedEx package. Um, so imagine getting 300 FedEx packages oh delivered to your house. Yeah, that's awesome. So this is like one of those use cases where like, oh wow, like anomaly detection. We ought to put something in this, because card issuance, issuing cards is a very critical part of the business as you can imagine. So we should really have some AI here running and doing anomaly detection go, hey, I don't think you typically don't send 300 cards to a single customer. Are you sure you want to do this? Detect that anomaly and, and stop it before it becomes an issue. I thought that was a, a particularly interesting uh, uh, experience that happened a few years back. So, yeah, I think a really good one. Um, we have a customer, uh, Pfizer. Of course, you know Pfizer, the the pharmaceutical company. Um, you know, did uh, COVID vaccines, and during the pandemic, you know, they were just inundated with people looking uh, for for answers to their questions related to the vaccine availability. Um, you know, and it wasn't just, uh, you know, it wasn't direct consumers necessarily, but it's doctors and, and hospitals and all sorts of, um, you know, suppliers or resellers that sell, right, their, their uh, drugs globally. So they set up a whole bunch of um, bots in different languages to answer all of these questions and then, you know, um, go through um, some triage into what they're really looking for as far as, uh, you know, information that they're, they're requiring. Uh, based on, you know, a patient or, you know, the specifics about the vaccine. So, you know, they did that in 35 different languages and, and, uh, and still using that today. So, you know, that really took the heat off of the organization, right? Because it's not just customer facing or contact center. It was also, right, everybody in the sales and suppliers and information that hospitals and other clinics needed. That was a good use case. You know, the, the one that came to my mind, and, and it wasn't so much a use case, but I, I think it's more of a telling example, and it, it fits along with what, what Rick and, and um, Amanda were talking about in terms of something will go wrong. Like if your process is bad, this is going to expose it. Um, you know, this is interacting with your your customers. And I was reading. I'm the IT guy, so don't don't go too far. I was reading in the Journal of Marketing. Uh, they did a study of uh, customer satisfaction with chatbots and, and AI agents, and the level of dissatisfaction that they experienced and felt when the, the bot had a name, an avatar, uh, hobbies. Like some people went all in on, on this thing. And I'll say our, our chatbot's Jesse, so uh, <laughs> he or she has a name. Um, the, the level of dissatisfaction went up when that, that agent, that AI agent, had all these uh, anthropomorphic uh, attributes. And there's your, your vocabulary word of the day. Um, so, 
you know, I, and I, I, I don't know, I didn't get to read the full article, but from a personal experience, I would rather my engineers spend more time engineering and less time decorating. Uh, but, you know, it's just something to really think about when you're, you're working on that experience uh, for the, the consumer facing little agent. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. one, one question we get all the time, uh, I, I get a lot is, is, you know, what are the right things? What are the foundational components uh, to do AI right for, for customer service? Uh, and when we talked a few weeks ago, uh, my counterpart reminded me we need a, a business problem. Uh, you know, so many times IT has the shiny toy and they want to put it in and, and, and show it off. Uh, but, but number one, you, you got to have a business problem to solve and it, it does need to be focused. It, it can't just be, you know, take 10% out of my run rate. You, you need to know where you want to, to focus this technology. A couple of other things you need, obviously, are, are data uh, to, to be able to, to train these agents and, and put something robust in place that can actually do the job. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a third thing you need, and this is going to seem shocking, is you need a culture that is actually okay with failure, because I promise you, you will fail. Uh, along the way, there's something that's going to go wrong, and you've got to be able to learn from it and embrace it, fix it, and, and move on. There's, there's no just slam dunks here uh, as you start implementing it. And, and to that end, you know, find a way to, to truly test and learn, you know, do something small. Right now in my contact center, I've got an A-B test going where one out of every thousand calls goes into this other path. And, and we're able to tell, are we getting the change we expect? Did CSAT tank on that one call? Uh, things like that. So the more you can segment it, measure it, uh, and learn from it, the better off you'll be. Yeah. I think that's really right. And I think the other thing, right, is if you have the data, um, you can continually adjust and you know tweak and make sure that you know you're getting the right results to your point. Um, you know, it's it's important to understand that the you know that the AI is it has kind of an all-encompassing term, but it means a lot of different things, right? You have to think about um, your natural language processing and your NLU. Um, you know, machine learning, right? So it can automatically, right, learn as it goes. Um, but if you have those, you know, all those pieces working in tandem together, um, I think it's a little bit, uh, you're, you're more successful because you have all of that, you know, fine tuned together versus, you know, if you have separate, you know, applications, separate things processing uh, this, the, the data, um, it's a little bit more cumbersome and, and can be more difficult for sure. Yeah, those are really good. I mean, data, 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 bad data, bad AI. Yeah. Um, I think patience is another one. I mean, it, AI is like a like a child in a way. You, you teach it. You 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 know you let it try to make some decisions. You give it some feedback. It makes different decisions next time. You got to You wouldn't train something in two weeks and then expect it to just go out there and just do whatever, right? You would always give that feedback and patience. So. Yeah, you have to think about it like a human. Yeah. Right? It's, I mean, if you're, you're trying to create a human, human essentially, yeah. so you yeah. got to be patient. You need a business partnership. Uh, if you're in technology, you need a business partnership that understands how AI works and is willing to be patient. And mm -hmm. I think the failure uh, point's a great point. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, businesses aren't tolerant to failure, and you have to be uh, because AI is is going to fail. That's the whole point. That's how it gets better. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I like those. Good. So I can give more of a business perspective. For us, it's about learning um, behavioral patterns before we build the use case. So when, when they're talking about, is your data clean? What data do you have? Sometimes the way that we've been approaching it is just starting a new form of data. So CX, UX, and we call it DX, our digital team, um, pretty much work in partnership in everything that we're doing right now. Uh, and you know, our DX team is using um, like a new tool called Quantum Metric to like understand what's going on, on our site and create be be behavioral patterns around that. We're looking at a new uh, voice of the customer, and we actually are looking at our voice of the lost customer, so the people that don't come in, and using speech and text analytics to at least create the data that we want that we could build AI around, and then build the use cases for our technology team to then say, help us solve this business problem. Can AI be part of that? 
So that's kind of how we're taking uh, a stab at it, of like how we're doing that and really understanding the patterns and behaviors of the consumer. And maybe you can't use the data that you have right now because it isn't clean, but what are the new pieces of data that you could use in the areas that are already pretty well and functioning um, that you could test some use cases so that if your organization isn't <laughs> open to you failing, you can maybe hit a slam dunk with something uh, that you already know that it's gonna be uh, able to, uh, accelerate your business. Mm -hmm. Great. This next question, I'm, I'm always fascinated by it and, and I'm looking forward to hear from Rick and others, uh, their response on it. Because when you start thinking about your organization and how you design your shop, like there's problems that are solved. You've got infrastructure and you've, you've got your cloud operations and things like that. But this is really, it's kind of a new space, right? New-ish. So how does the organizational structure around AI for customer service work at your organization. And to that end, like who gets to pick the algorithms, who builds the models, uh, uh, who, who works with the pipelines, like how does that work? Yeah, I'd say for us it varies. Um, you know, our fraud department that's trying to look at transactions and figure out what's fraud, like they have their own research, research science division. Uh, that's a very, very large, as you can imagine, portion of the company. Mm -hmm. There's other very small teams that are just kind of doing their own um, data uh, and model development. So I think for us, it kind of it's, it fits whatever need. So we have definitely have research science happening in the business. We have some being built for tech. We have tons and tons of governance at every step in, in the development process. We have governance and oversight strictly for that privacy concern, making sure that we're doing the right thing and that everything looks uh, the way it's supposed to. So yeah, for us, it, it's sort of kind of all over the map depending on the use case and, and, and what we're focused on, so. I can talk more about, so on our business side, we um, made sure that we structured everybody that would touch the customer under one leader. Um, so you've got digital, marketing, advertising, CX, um, contact center and sales leadership all under one um, you know, uh, SLT member, mm -hmm. which allows that SLT member to create one vision of what do we want the customer to expect and what do they want, we want them to experience. So then it's not um, digital versus physical. Mm -hmm. It's not um, customer experience versus revenue. We're all working together with shared, you know, goals and objectives to make sure that what we're delivering is going to actually support overall profitability, but you know, the, the, the customer experience and we're not making decisions in silos. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll say within Unum, so we, we have a digital incubator that um, really set up what's our evaluation criteria when we look at models or, or algorithms uh, that ensures that across uh, all of our IT delivery areas, we're, we're judging things off the same set of metrics. We, we don't, we don't want to have different definitions of, of accuracy um, when, when it comes to uh, evaluating models. Outside of that incubator, it, it's in a number of pockets. All of the contact center works in, in my area, but similarly under the business, there's a single business accountable leader uh, to ensure we're not negatively impacting CSAT or uh, our SLAs with, with our clients that we ultimately sell to. Uh, in, in some cases, they're paying for talking to a human. So mm -hmm. we've got to be very, very cognizant of that uh, as we have this kind of federated model for delivering AI solutions at Unum. Uh, have you seen anything that works particularly well or is it same experience across the map? I think, I think it's pretty much the same experience. I mean, you know, it goes back to, you know, what, what do you think well, set your goals for what you think you can automate or, or is the appropriate use case for, for automated interactions with conversational AI. But, you know, there's always going to be a case where you definitely want to have, um, you know, humans involved, right, um, from the beginning. So it just depends on the use case. But if, if you get into situations where it gets pretty complex, um, especially uh, for, for the customer side, um, then you you know you probably want to you know, shift more to human interactions rather than than um, you know virtual assistant. Yeah. yeah. So I guess last question uh, is kind of out there. You know what what does the future hold? Uh, where where are we headed? Uh, and you know we've we've talked about empathy a couple of times. 
Uh, at Unum, we, we talk about empathy at scale. Uh, we're in, in our contact centers, we're, we're meeting our members at a moment in time that, that's uh, stressful for them, right? Uh, they're, they're out on disability or they've had an accident. <clears throat> Maybe they're in maternity, which, you know, that's a very happy moment, but if you're not sleeping or your, your baby's not sleeping, it, it, that's not great either. Uh, so we really attempt to empower empathy uh, and we do that through humans. Now, you know, over time, the capabilities in the market have gotten great at detecting sentiment and, and being able to find the tone and things like that on the other end of the line. It's not great at, you know, repeating that back, at, at presenting a uh, empathetic uh, AI agent, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, you can do that in text, but mm -hmm. when you start trying to intercept some of these in your IVR with voice, uh, we're just not there yet in terms of being able to replicate what a human can do. Uh, I, I don't think we're that far off from that. There's a lot of smart people working on it. Uh, and that's, that's one of my hopes, you know, to, to be able to, to generate that back uh, and free up our humans to, to work on those moments that matter. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's definitely, um, you know, being able to automate things or assist people through interactions, whether it's front office or back office, um, uh, is, you know, that's really the key um, because it creates more efficient, satisfying uh, interactions when you are actually uh, working uh, with uh, yeah, a human agent. Um, but then also, you know, the self-service side uh, with an automated uh, assistant, Yes, you can detect sentiment and all those sorts of things, um, but uh, depending on how well you build, you know, your virtual assistant, it may come across as insincere or, or, or not appropriate. So, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. The empathy one. I mean, we definitely pass that information over to agents, so they have an understanding that someone's frustrated or angry. Um, so we do give that information to the agent desktop, and of course, everything that they were doing. Uh, in the self-service interaction, now the bot continues with them to continue and they can pick up um, where the customer le left off on the self-service side. But uh, yeah, I, you know, and the other thing I like to talk about, you know, I think for a lot of us, if you're really thinking out there in the future, you know, is, is the entry point to your organization really a mobile app or um, your website, right? So think about um, through SMS, through voice, um, could someone just simply interact with your company through conversation, right? And instead of going through a traditional IVR where you, you know, you've got certain branches built and if you get so far down and you realize you're at the wrong place, you have to start over. I mean, I've actually hung up the phone, right? And redialed to start again, right? So customers go through that. Well, what if you greeted them and through voice or like I said, a digital channel, um, they can just start asking their question and interacting in a, in a natural way. Um, you know, conversation, um, and then they decide the direction of, of where they're going to go and so on. So I really think that's probably the future, right? And it's not that we won't still have websites and mobile apps, but it'll just be augmented or somebody will just say, hey, like Alexa, I can just start talking to SafeLight and create my own experience with that interaction journey. Yeah. 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 No, I think, I think, Human assistance, augmenting a human's capabilities is definitely, I think that's probably one of the first things we'll see some, some significant progress toward. Um, I think even further, maybe, I, I, think us, I think we're going to start moving into prediction and proactive servicing. So basically, mm -hmm. move away from, okay, when a customer calls us, we're going to be using chat bots and IVR, and we're going to be using a bunch of context to make that servicing great. I think that's great. I think that'll happen very soon. I think where we can go from there is like before they ever come to us, can we predict what they're going to need and just give it to them? Mm -hmm. if, if we predict they're going to need a credit increase, can we just increase their credit line? Like, why do we need to wait for them to ask? If we think that they, they're they going to need a, a home loan, like a, a loan for a home renovation, can we just pre-approve them for a home loan? Like, can we get out in front of their needs even further? So for, for me, I think prediction is kind of that next frontier. Once we, we get the baseline assistance kind of uh, uh, in check, that's where we're going to be probably going next, in my opinion. Yeah, my, my example was going to be the smart speaker, because mm. I think that voice has a lot of opportunity. I think a lot of businesses have struggled, and I know we had an Alexa plug-in like years ago, but 
it didn't really work because it wasn't really tied to a business problem. It was cool. Replace my windshield. Yes, replace my windshield. Yeah, like it just didn't have like a good <laughs> business application. So I think that over time, the Googles and the Amazons and all of these um, companies that are creating Apple with your with your phone are going to need to start partnering with businesses. And I, you know, how do you kind of find really? Ex great examples and use cases that we can use the smart speaker. And then I would just add that um, I was listening to um, a, a, a gentleman, and now I'm forgetting his name. Um, I think it's uh, Dr. Feng Yu Li, who is, I believe he is the head of uh, Google in China, and he is an AI expert. And he was talking more about what he thinks AI was going to look like in the next 20 years. And the three things that he actually said that he doesn't feel like we're going to be able to solve is, um, so these are things that maybe we shouldn't be kind of focusing on because um, he, he doesn't think the technology will get there fast enough. One was creativity. So what are the types of things or use cases that allow creativity? How do we remove that from our you know, AI business case? Two is empathy. So he, he feels that over time you can program something to do one thing and solve one problem, but empathy is about reacting to another person or another human. Like we can't all describe why love is love or what is happening in our brain today that actually creates that. So really making sure that we understand that empathy is always going to be a part of the human experience and AI is not going to solve that. And three is just general de dexterity, because when you teach something to learn one thing or to solve one problem, being able to transition to another one seamlessly is not going to happen in the next 20 years. Yeah. So he talked about those three things, which I thought was extremely fascinating, that in the next 20 years, there's a lot of things that are going to be happening and things that we're going to be able to automate um, or be predictive about. But it always is going to be solving that one thing because a human told it to go do that. Yeah, that's a good point. We are opening it for questions, right? I think. Yeah. Yes. Right. That fun Three part. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody has any. Any questions from the audience? Coming. I'm coming. I have a mic. Oh, we have a mic coming. <laughs> so given the positions you guys are in, do you ever at night have a moment to think ahead and, and you have an impact, the possibility to affect this trajectory? especially Amex or anything on this level, mm. setting precedent, you know, if, if you could take it as philosophical as possible, how, where are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. I, I do. I think that the engineer part of me wants to go as fast as possible and build and do and go. But I feel like the more philosophical part of me wants to ask the question, like, should we, should we do some of the things that we think we can do? Yeah, so I, I, I try to make it a part of my thinking, even though it's it's not first nature for me because I'm an engineer and I want to build things and I want to show that things are possible to do. But not always, things being possible doesn't always mean that they should be done. Um, so I think that you know trying to instill that uh, ethical sort of boundary around things like AI, things that are so emerging, that are so powerful and profound uh, is important as well. So, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Okay, we have time for one more. Hi, um, I was wondering what you guys have experienced in terms of trying to educate the consumer or your customer on how to use the AI or promote using the AI. You know, obviously it'll be your first line of defense in some of your call centers, but you know, for instance, in a hotel setting, you know, if there's a chat bot or something that can help order towels for you, you know, instead of picking up and down in zero, how do you guys, you know, promote that in any cases in your uh, businesses? I'll just jump off something Amanda said, which is like, I don't think you should have to train a customer in using AI. I think that's the point. Mm -hmm. The point should be that the customer really doesn't, doesn't know the difference, shouldn't know the difference. It should feel relatively seamless to them. So we're working actually, um, we work with a lot of insurance clients. Um, uh, they're, you know, we partner with them and, and, and do their glass and, actually uh, myself and our head of digital is working on guiding the customer towards the right path. So they think picking up the phone because that's the first thing that they just know is the actual quickest path to file a claim and get their glass fixed. It's actually not, it takes longer. Um, it's a longer process, it's longer time. So what we're trying to do is give them choice 
and try to guide them through that experience to say, hey, if you do this on digital, you're going to save like three or four minutes. Would you like to do that? And most people, if you're giving them choice, we've seen this. Um, when we gave them choice in our IVR, one of our clients saw an 80% opt-in rate for SMS. Average is 40. So we gave them a choice. You can stay, you can schedule, you can stay on the phone. It's going to take 12 to 15 minutes, or you can go digital. It'll take five. What do you want to do? Time is always precious. So if you can present it in a way and give them options, I think you can help guide them towards the optimal path. And then it, it helps you to um, get exposure. And, and frictionless is the key. They had to yeah. go to your website to find the phone number. So if you give them a way to engage with live chat. Or, or Google. Or, or, or Google. Or, it depends or, if you're working with your, if yeah. your <laughs> SEO team, which we are, but yes. Yeah, exactly.